I think it's time, so let's get started. Thank you for all being here. Today's session is uh, Distributed Cache Empowers AI ML Workload on Kubernetes Cluster. We build a distributed cache system on Kubernetes and use it for AI ML Workload in our own premise. We've uploaded our slides, so if you need, please check it. He's Yuichou from Japan. He works for Prepare Networks, which is an AI ML company in Japan. I'll explain our company's cluster in detail later. I'm Toru, which is colleagues. Also, I'm a founder of Yoki, a CNCF Sandbox project, and the maintainer of some OSSEs related to CNCF. This is today's agenda. So we first introduce background AI and the ML workload on Kubernetes cluster. Second, we talked about the main topic, a simple cache services that is developed for AI ML workloads to solve the problem that we'll talk about the background. Third, we describe the real world use cases. Next, in deploy consolidation, we'll describe techniques to achieve higher performance. In the end, we conclude the talk. Okay, next, Richard explains our background. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, we start the talk from artificial intelligence and machine learning workloads. So let's consider the training of machine learning model that recognize a numerical digit. So we have a data set of pictures with numbers and the training job of deep neural networks. Here, it is a correspond to a two Kubernetes spots. So Kubernetes spots will access the data set and get the data samples and feed the deep neural networks with the data samples. So it will optimize the model. Then by continuing the iterations, the deep neural network will become to be able to recognize the numbers. Here, I'd like to look at the strategies to store the data set. So we are AI and ML company with on-premise Kubernetes cluster. So we need on-premise solutions for that. First one is a NFS. So we can mount NFS storage to Kubernetes spots by using a host pass volume. NFS is fast if the NFS server has a fast storage drives, fast CPUs. Uh, yeah. So if the number of clients is limited, the performance is acceptable. However, the large number of clients access the NFS, you can easily notice the performance slowdowns. Second one is object storage. We have uh, on-premise uh, SV compatible object storage with open source software, uh, Apache Ozons. We are using hardware drives as the backend. So by adding a new hardware drives, we can scale the performance and its capacity. Actually, the performance of hardware drives are not sufficient to perform a random read of data set. So it cannot be a solution for the data set loading. Third is the node local strategies. So our compute node with AI accelerators has additional NVMe drives. So it is designed to use as ephemeral volumes of AI and ML workloads. So the problem here is the workload is moved to different compute nodes, the data will be unreachable. So for example, we have uh, two compute nodes, A and B. So firstly, the data set has scheduled to a compute node A. The workload caches the data set to the node local strategies. After that, workload may be preempted. So fortunately, we have another compute node B. So the workload will be moved to the another nodes. We have a cache data in compute node A, but we cannot access there without any service in compute node A. So we have to fetch the data set again. It is very time consuming. So therefore, node local storage itself helps the training, but cannot be a final storage solution for that. Also, if the, data, uh, if the training requires a larger uh, data set than uh, its capacity, we cannot use it as a cache storage, so it is not scalable. 
This is our grand design of uh, strategies for AI and ML workloads. We are going to combine uh, object storage and node local strategies to construct our hierarchical storage systems. The port will access the cloud of NVMe drives fast, and if the data exists in the cloud, we can skip the access to the object strategies. If the data does not exist in the cloud, we have to access the object strategies. The capacity of the strategies is scalable by adding new hard disk drives to object strategies, and the throughput is scalable by adding new compute nodes or adding new NVMe drives. Therefore, I think it is very suitable solutions for AI and ML workloads. So in this session, we'd like to introduce our hierarchical storage solutions on the top of uh, cloud-native technologies. So developing storage solutions seems difficult, but utilizing Kubernetes features like discoveries and authentications and Envoy's features are like its load balancing technologies and its flexibility, uh, we have developed the strategies very easily. Next, uh, we'll introduce our simple CAS services, SGS. SGS is a simple, um, fast, and shared nothing architecture. Since SGS has a very basic HTTP get and pull interface, and just returns the local, node local files when users fetch the data. It's incredible, simple, and fast. Also, SGS is designed for cloud native. Those SGS runs on Kubernetes clusters and uses a lot of Kubernetes features to reduce our own implementation. Also, SGS adapts shared machine architecture. It's essential because this enables SGS to be scalable. Another important thing to note is that SGS is just cache services, not persistent storage. In other words, there is no need to keep the data forever. And it's acceptable to delete the cache later. This is how you can actually use SGS using a car command. It's easiest, isn't it? The first car stores the cache data after the JPEG in SGS, and the second one fits the data in first car stored. OK, let's take a closer look. First, look at the uh, HTTP method. First car uses a put to store the data, and the second one uses a get to fetch it. Uh, this is a natural. Next is a URL. The first, thing, the first thing you'll notice is that it uses HTTP and uh, Kubernetes services, right? And if you look at the path of a URL, it specifies the bucket and the object. In this example, the bucket is project Fuber and the object is Apple. Okay, next is the authentication part. We'll discuss this later. Uh, please keep in mind uh, that an uh, auth header is required. In this part, we deduce our own implementation by making good use of the bound service account token. This is the future of Kubernetes. Let's look at the path of these car commands. This is a diagram showing how users access the SGS. Users pod do something similar to the car command we looked. SGS has the actual data or cache as a file. As mentioned before, the action that SGS application does is just return this file. The first thing you'll notice is that there are Kubernetes services and Envoy between users' pods and the SGS. Before we go into more detail, let's take a closer look at SGS itself. SGS is made up of three main components. First is a Go language application and the NVMe or other storage that holds the cache data. And SQLite, which is holds the metadata like uh, access timestamp or something like that. Each SCS application has its own SQLite. In this example, there are four SQLite because there are four SCS applications. Uh, of course, each SCS is running as a pod, 
In our cluster, they are split out using demo set. Back to the diagram. Okay. One of the most significant features is the shared nothing architecture. It means that nothing like RDB is shared between each SGS pod. Despite this, users can access the cache data from any network zone. In order to achieve this, layer seven load balancing uses a consistent hashing. Okay, next, this is a flow of authorization in SGS. It's similar to Kube RBAC proxy. If you have uh, used it, you can understand it smoothly. First, a user pod should mount a service account token and send out a request with it. The verifying part, it is uh, SGS is charged of all it, uses a token level API to verify the token. The service account can tell SCS the namespace of the request source. This can be used for authentication. Therefore, users can specify the namespace that can access the bucket. Now well, let's define your bucket. You can define a bucket like this. There are two types of a bucket, public and uh, private. The top orange part is a bucket uh, called uh, public bucket, which anyone can access. The blue part below is called private bucket and uh, is authenticated based on Kubernetes namespace. It's possible to list the namespaces that are allowed to access the bucket. For instance, Project Kubernetes and the use of Tamoku namespaces are allowed to access the Kubecon bucket. It's also possible to set storage limits for each bucket in the bucket quota field. If the specified capacity is exceeded, the bucket will start to delete cache data on LRU basis. This figure shows how data is deleted in the LRU. Firstly, the color. So each color represents, uh, represents a bucket. They are loaded with more and more data with shifting the start time. The dot in the blue circle is the maximum capacity allocated for each bucket. Once there, each bucket has no further increase in capacity. This means that LRU-based data deletion had started here. Next, we we'll talked about the real-world use cases. We we'll introduced two use cases. One use case is use SGS as a cache for slower storage. The motivation of developing SGS has started from here. It accelerates data loading throughput of dataset. The second use case is SGS as a storage backend for yet another cache service. Let's dive into case one. First, let's consider the data loading from object storage like S3 or, or something like this. In order to abstract the IO layers, we developed PFIO for our researchers. Since it's OSS, you can check it out now. The source code in Python is a sample code to get a JPEG file from object storage with only 10 lines of code. Also, PFIO has a transparent cache feature. Just adding a HTTP cache parameter to form URL function, PFIO automatically catches the content and get it from its SGS next time. If the file is hit in SGS, the lead latency improved because we could skip getting it from object storage and uh, put it into SGS. Next, let's look at case two. How to use SGS as a storage backend for yet another cache service. There are several large files uh, we haven't mentioned yet. First is a container image. Container images for AI and ML workloads are larger and larger. Our only man container image that is the first choice for our researchers uh, is more than 30 gigabyte. We have already built it and uh, last week, 94% of container images pools hit the SES. The other the model, 
you know LLM is large. And sometimes our researchers evaluate public LLM in a hugging phase, so we have its capacity, a cash utility. Both files, uh, both files have characteristics like being ephemeral, large, and hot. Normally, we use the latest container image, so the outdated container image should be deleted. This can be done by SGS the error policy. Therefore, the combination of SGS and the cache service for these files works very well. This is an example of implementing yet another cache. Of course, SGS is used as a storage backend. Yet another cache must be implemented several features like access to origin service, access to SGS, user interface, URLs mapping from origin key to USGS. However, storage management like cache eviction and the capacity control, uh, which is uh, difficult to implement, is already implemented in SGS. So writing yet another cache is easier. So in these sections, we are going to talk about the deployment of simple cache service. Here, we have uh, two questions to optimize the deployment. One is, how can we optimize the network traffic between user ports and Envoy? We are using Kubernetes service to discover the Envoy port. Here, we will consider the configurations of Kubernetes service and the deployment of Envoy. The other is, how can we configure Envoy to route the traffic to the SCS? By considering the two questions, we can optimize the end-to-end -end data flow from user ports to the SCS ports. Okay, so let's start from the question one. So how can we optimize the network traffic? So first, I'd like to describe our computing infrastructure where the SCS is running right now. So we, our preferred networks, are AI and machine learning company. So we are developing machine learning models, like our large language models and many solutions to the industries. So these activities use our on-premise computing infrastructures. So we have uh, three Kubernetes clusters for productions and uh, several evaluations and staging clusters. As a total, uh, there are more than 400 Kubernetes nodes with uh, 30,000 CPU cores, uh, 300 terabytes memory, and also uh, 2,000 GPUs for uh, machine learning models training. So also, we are developing and operating our own AI accelerator chip called MN Core. So we are doing almost everything of AI accelerators uh, from uh, RTLs, uh, both designs, server designs, uh, drivers, and also uh, device plugins for Kubernetes, and also uh, graph compilers. So I'd like to introduce the data center network also. So our company, uh, Preferred Networks, uses a cross-network topology. Cross-network topology uses uh, multi-stage switches, uh, deep switches, spine switches, and uh, external super spine switches. Deep switch is the most nearest switch from the compute node. So here, we can define uh, four network zones by each deep switch, uh, network zone A, B, C, and D. So, because uh, there are three nodes in the same deep switch can communicate with uh, non-blocking performance. However, the communication between different zones, like zone A and zone D, requires uh, deep and spine switches communications. So network links between deep switches and spine switches is uh, oversubscribed. In other words, the uplink is uh, narrower than downlinks. So if the old node in a uh, network zone try communicating to uh, different zones, congestion happens. Therefore, we have to avoid the interzone communications as much as possible to save uplinks. Okay, so I have described the background. So 
let's consider the network traffic from user port to envoy port. First, as assumptions, SCS is deployed to the all compute nodes to use all local NVMe drives effectively. Also, user port may be scheduled to any nodes because all compute nodes have the expensive accelerators, so there is no meaning of keeping the compute resource idle. So where to deploy envoys? Here, we decided to deploy Envoy to all compute nodes. By doing so, we can reduce the network traffic between a user port and Envoy port. However, we cannot optimize the interzone traffic uh, between Envoy and SCS. Because SCS has deployed to all compute nodes, so we cannot optimize about the interzone traffic. So next, I'd like to consider the configurations of Kubernetes service to reduce interzone traffic. In other words, uh, perform communications in a topology aware ways. We have a user port and envoy port in all compute nodes. So there are two methods to reduce the interzone traffic. One is a internal traffic policy, and the other is a topology aware routing. So let's start talk from uh, internal traffic policies. Internal traffic policy limits the communication to the service internally. So if the service have, uh, the service have uh, many envoy ports as backend, but the internal traffic policy only routes the traffic to the port within the same node. So we don't have communications between compute nodes. Topology aware routing differs from uh, internal traffic policies. Topology aware routing routes the traffic to the same zone. So in this case, we have a three envoy port to route the traffic now. It requires communication in the same zone, but not in the different zones. Therefore, it seems internal traffic policy is better than topology aware routing from the perspective of uh, networking. However, the viewpoint of Envoy's CPU load balance, we have a different conclusions. Internal traffic policy doesn't route the traffic to the other two ports. So therefore, if some node uses SCS heavily, uh, we can see the high CPU usage of uh, Envoy in the node. Since we deployed Envoy as a demo set, so we cannot increase a CPU resource request with a fine-grained manner. However, a topology aware routing utilizes a three envoy backend, so the CPU load balance is uh, relaxed. Therefore, we can see more consistent latency numbers in a topology aware routing. Therefore, we are using topology aware routing to improve the CPU load imbalance of Envoy. That is a good balance of network traffic and load balancing. So next question is, how can we configure the Envoy to route the traffic? So we'll consider the last part of data flow. So here, let's consider the load balancing of keys. So in SCS, the key corresponds to a bucket and object. So in this design, we want to route the traffic from Envoy to SCS consistently. So consistent means when we put the object to a fast SCS, we want to get it from the same SCS. Otherwise, we cannot get the object we have put it before. The easiest way to achieve that is uh, introduce a mapping from bucket and object to SCS backend ID. It introduces a shared DB, so sometimes shared DB performance slows down. So here, consider sharing, yeah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, this can be a solution, but we want to use more simple and more scalable way. 
So here, we don't share the database, but the shares the functions to determine which is responsible for. We introduce the hash functions from bucket and object to some numbers. Then we decide the responsible backend from the number. The simplest calculation to determine the responsible backend is just divide the hash value by the number of backends, then use the reminder. The problem of that is that when the number of backend changes, almost every key demaps. So typically, it happens during node failure and node installations. So we should avoid this. Consistent hashing is a method which solves this problem. It's designed to uh, reduce such a demapping, so we can expect more lower demapping. Uh, so the key count divided by the backend count is our uh, ideal numbers. Envoy has uh, two consistent hashing implementations. One is ding hash. First, it prepares a ding with a responsible backend by hashing the backend information. When access happens, it calculates the hash of keys, then search responsible backend from the ding. The other is Maghreb, which manages a set of responsible hashes. Both mappings are computed from the backend information. So all Envoy pods share this mapping. Therefore, we can see the consistent mapping in all Envoy pods. Load balancing of keys is very important. The backend with a larger key responsibility have several problems. So in this figure, you can see the length of arc of backend three is 1.5 times longer than backend four. Therefore, backend three is 1.5 times of responsibility of backend four. So it should be avoided because it affects the performance. So CPU usage of backend three is 1.5 times of backend four. So it may result the longer latency numbers. Also, the lifetime of each data in backend three is shorter than backend four. So more possibility of deletions in backend three nodes. Here, we want to see the consistent resource usage and its lifetime. Uh, we need a consistent hashing with a consistent size of key mappings. So let's check the load imbalance of both consistent hashing algorithms. In this figure, a ding hash has a load imbalance up to 1.5 times. However, Maghreb doesn't introduce any load imbalance. So let's see the screenshot of object count per node. The screenshot is taken from our production environment. Each line corresponds to a number of objects per node. So as you can see, when using ding hash, you can see the multiple lines with some wheels. However, when using a maglev, you can see the only single lines. But actually, there are multiple lines. So it means uh, load balance of maglev algorithm is uh, perfect. That is why we are using maglev. OK, so we have deployed the SCS to the production environment. So let's check the performance numbers. This is our API calls per second in the last 30 days. As you can see, uh, the highest is uh, 37,000 of requests per second. Also, uh, this is the aggregate throughput per second in the last 30 days. As you can see, the highest is uh, 75 gigabytes per second as the uh, aggregated through, uh, traffic. So as a summary, we achieved uh, 37,000 requests per second with uh, 75 gigabytes per second with uh, only 55 backend servers. I think it is not so much number of backend servers. Also, this number is, uh, comes from the real world, not the synthetic benchmark. 
So currently, we are serving uh, 268 million objects. Almost request to SCS is indeed uh, heavy, and uh, we are continuously watching the not found rate to expand the cache capacity in a timely manner. So let's conclude the talk. So we have introduced uh, our cache service, uh, simple cache services. It is designed to, with a shared nothing architecture to see the linear scaling. This is easily implemented by uh, Envoy's consistent hashing algorithms. Also, we are following uh, cloud native best practice, like a bundle service account token from Kubernetes to implement authentication easily. So our system can be used as a transparent cache of object storage with PFIO, our IO abstraction libraries. So we are using SCS in the real world, like uh, dataset loading and large model servings. So we use several optimization techniques, like uh, topology level routing and maglevs. So our project is uh, supported by uh, cloud native technologies and our three intensive members. So that's all. So thank you for paying attention. If you have any feedback, please uh, scan. Uh, please scan it, and uh, anyone can. And any questions? Out of curiosity, is there a reason why you didn't go with a cluster file system? We've been doing X scale storage for a long time, and it's not. It's much more scalable than uh, NFSs. I've got 80 petabytes of storage back at my cluster today and I have over 1,000 nodes, which, you know, 120,000 cores. So I'm curious what, why you ruled that out. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, come again. I'm curious why you didn't use a cluster file system, not NFS, something like GPFS or mm -hmm. Luster or Weka or whatnot. There's probably a reason. I'm curious why you have not, you decided not to. I think just using a raster or some other ZPFS, uh, like a shared file system can be a solution, but uh, it's a, I think, uh, actually I have not tried the, such a shared file systems, but it has uh, some difficulties to operate uh, such a large storage clusters. But by applying uh, cloud native technologies to have uh, our own Kubernetes cluster, uh, we can uh, get a storage is more easier. I, we, we, I, we think that is more easier uh, to use such as these solutions. Thank you. Other questions? OK, that's all. Thank you for all being here. Yeah.